Hello, I'm Jeffrey Gorman. We're at the Jane Sauer Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm going to give you a tour of my new show, which is called A Dog's Tale. And A Dog's Tale really has to do with my upbringing, which was a somewhat Huck Finn-like upbringing, where I grew up in an old farm and there were quarries and barns and big, huge fields, and every adventure I seemed to have was with a dog. So my show this summer is basically honoring those dogs that I grew up with. And I'm going to start with this first piece. The first piece I did in this show, which kind of kicked off the whole idea of the dog's tail, is this piece right here. And you've got the classic dog chasing his tail, which I think is just hilarious. And, you know, I think of tails as so expressive. They're such an expressive armature. And some animals have tails that that don't do much, but dogs certainly, you know, they're emotional highs and lows by the way they handle their tails. What I like about this tail right here is it's old electrical wiring that I got at Habitat for Humanity and it becomes kind of the hair as he's chasing around his tail here. The next dog in the series is something I've been working on for a couple of years and it's really uh, influenced by the the 18th century photographer Edward Moybridge, who some people call the father of film, but he did the stop action photography of animals and humans, and he was the first one to show that horses, when they ran, all four feet were off the ground. So this is how you might see a dog running, but it's really stop action here, so you can see them in motion. Obviously, they run so fast, we don't get to see the articulation of the legs. One thing you'll see in this show, which is a little different for me too now, is I'm starting to use larger objects almost as props with the work. You can see it in this dog here where I found this wonderful old wooden kid's chair, I think it's oak, and it had just a wonderful patina on it, and I thought, if a dog had that chair, how would he use it? And I think we've often seen a dog that's standing on something, and here, this dog is barking at the squirrel. And the squirrel has this big rock, and the squirrel is about to drop the rock on the dog, and the dog's barking at the squirrel. And then what I've done on the chair is I've kind of written what this dog is thinking. And she's thinking that if that rock hits her nose, it's going to really hurt because her nose previously was sunburned. Have you ever seen a dog with a sunburned nose? It's not a pretty sight. This piece is a little unusual for me. I don't know if you can tell, but this is gold leaf on it and there's gold leaf on the back. A friend of mine gave me this panel. It's actually a painting panel for somebody to do a triptych. And to me, it had a really medieval feel to it. So they gave it to me, and I thought for a while, you know, how would you use a piece like this with the type of work I'm doing? And I thought it'd be fun to have a family portrait from maybe the Renaissance or something like that. You think of the Medicis or one of those Italian families. And I'm sure in the dog world, there's a hierarchy and there must be dogs that are really, you know, the, the, the uh, king and queen of the, of the dog world. So you've got the, the father, the mother, the daughter, and the son. And what I did with the tin in the back here is I kind of made it look like a landscape, almost like the Mona Lisa. And then it so happened that the tins I was using to fabricate this were old champagne bottle tins that I had collected from somewhere. And one of the names of the champagne was the Cordugno Champagne. So I'm calling this the Cordugno family in honor of the champagne tins that I used to fabricate this piece. The rest of the show is a wide variety of birds and animals that I have for some reason had an interaction with. This crow right here, it's very funny, he's found this book and the title of the book is called The Seed Beneath the Snow. He thinks there's a seed in the book, so he started tearing the book apart, but he doesn't realize that it's just the title of a book. For this show, I did two bats. I'm kind of obsessed with bats, and I got these old slide boxes from Habitat for Humanity, but to me, they kind of had more of a scientific feel, like maybe a, a box you bring into the woods when you're a naturalist on a trip. So these bats are hanging out above these these uh, toolboxes that might have various tools to figure out the weight of the bat and the species and their migratory habits and things like that. I found this old 
side table and it almost has a feeling of tramp art to it. And I cut the legs off and I thought, what would climb up on something like this? And we know that a raccoon will climb just about anywhere. So this raccoon is up here, but she really shouldn't be up here. I've started working with picnic baskets and I thought, who would really like a picnic basket? And of course, ravens would. This was based on my trip when I went to Ireland and I saw all the rooks. And the thing about rooks in Ireland is, they will build a nest anywhere. So I thought if American ravens had a picnic basket, they'd probably build a nest in it. So you've got these two ravens in here and they're in the process of building this nest and they've taken a bunch of the stuff from the picnic basket to build the nest. This is the last piece in the show. As you all know, I build a lot of rabbits because I kind of think of them as the tricksters of the animal world. But this rabbit right here has a terrible memory and she's found this elephant, this little sculpture of this elephant, and she thinks that if she has it, her memory is going to improve. So she carries this everywhere she goes. I hope you enjoyed the show. You can see this year that I've incorporated more objects. I've worked with dogs, and I've got my usual wild array of fanciful animals.